Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at the Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. Hello and welcome to Naked Reflections. It would be an exaggeration to say that there are many beliefs about what we should eat as what we should believe about religion, but sometimes it feels that way. And like religious adherents, advocates of different dietary regimes often tussle amongst themselves to claim the moral high ground. There is veganism, no animal products, vegetarianism, no meat or fish, pescatarianism, no meat, responsible meat eating, self-declared and, to be honest, expensive. And then there's a lot of folk who can't afford to think about what probably seems to them such niceties. And let's not forget that sometimes matters of diet are hard baked into religious dogma. Think of halal and kosher food. Feeding body and soul is our subject this week. There are moral and theological aspects to this, of course, but in a world of threatened resources and growing population, the question of sustainability looms large. Here's Peter Scarborough speaking on The Naked Scientist Show. Can we be healthy and sustainable? The work that we've been looking at is to say, OK, well, let's take a vegetarian diet and a vegan diet and compare it to a meat based diet, measure the greenhouse gas emissions from those diets and compare across them. And what we found that is in the UK, a meat eating diet has about double the greenhouse gas emissions of a vegan diet. And it's got about 50 percent more greenhouse gas emissions related than a vegetarian diet. Joining me this week to discuss feeding body and soul is David Clough, professor of theology and applied science at the University of Aberdeen. David has a special interest in Christian vegan and vegetarianism and is the author of On Animals, A Systematic Theology. I have to confess, David, I've always struggled with any systematic theology, so I'm looking forward to unpacking that with you. And welcome to Lutvi Radwan, who together with his wife, Ruby, a specialist in mental well-being, runs Willowbrook Farm in Oxfordshire. He was previously lecturer in environmentalism in Oxford before moving into the world of farming, which they run together on holistic halal principles, including the raising and slaughtering of animals. Well, welcome both. David, to what extent is the need for sustainability an important pillar of your argument? Thinking about what we eat as this astonishingly basic component of how we relate to the wider world, we're literally ingesting fellow creatures, uh, you know, that is a crucial way in which we're relating to the wider world. So sustainability is just one aspect of the way we might think constructively about what our eating practice means for our relationship uh, with that world. So I'm keen for us to be thinking about the ways in which our diet impacts on um, sort of the animals that are raised and killed for us to eat, but also the wider implications on you know, the viability of life on our planet, of which the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are, are crucial factors. And it turns out that our eating practice has implications in, in relation to all of those kinds of ways. So I think they, they all belong together, as well as thinking about what counts for sustainable human living. So I, I don't think we can separate out climate issues, biodiversity issues, um, animal welfare issues, uh, human welfare issues. We need to be recognizing that food connects all of these things in a remarkable way. How does that apply to you, Ludwig? Because I'm thinking about the question of sustainability. Your farm is on a very small scale with, there's not a huge amount of capacity for this sort of farming. So, you know, is, is it a sensible way forward or is it just, um, I don't know, a foolish aspiration, if I can be cruel. I would agree with the way David has presented the issues. And um, I think from a perspective of faith, it's fundamental um, to recognise that, that we are in a particular role, but not one of superiority of dominion or of the right to actually sort of to, to treat the rest of creation in a certain way. But it's actually a, a responsibility, rather. I mean, there's a fundamental verse in the Quran, actually, Pollution and corruption has appeared upon the land and the seas as a result of humankind's own actions, in order that they may taste the consequences of their actions, and in the hope that they will seek to return to the right path. The use of the term facade in Arabic, pollution, corruption, uh, actually is incredibly 
pertinent because it highlights both the social injustice and the environmental injustice being linked the fact that corruption uh, is linked to pollution and I think that's increasingly uh, something that everyone is now aware of that the, the fight for climate justice is the fight for social justice um, fundamentally you know the Quran reminds us that we are the khulafa fil art we are the, um, the stewards upon the earth and that's not just a carte blanche to act in, in the way that we wish. This is actually a responsibility that can place us at the pinnacle of creation, but also places us at the abyss. Um, we have that choice. It is a moral choice. It's a question of exercising our free will to actually become sentient beings, take our responsibilities seriously and address that. So this sort of walking sensitively and carefully upon the earth is very much part and parcel of this whole concept of, of stewardship within Islam. It's really interesting to hear you talk about dominion and stewardship, Lutfi. Obviously, people often hear that word dominion uh, and think this is some kind of religious license for human activity that's entirely disregarding of the well-being of fellow creatures. And it seems to me that religious traditions have often been raided for justifications for that kind of um, activity. But in context, in the opening chapter of Genesis, it can't possibly have meant that because a vegan diet, for example, is stipulated there. And in the modern context, it seems to me that dominion is a very apt description of what is the case in terms of this astonishing power that the human species has uh, to impact the well-being both of ourselves and of other kinds of creatures. Uh, but as you say, that focuses attention on the need for us to be thinking in a responsible way about how that power is to be exercised. And so then I think there's less tension between ideas of dominion and stewardship, because in both cases, we recognize the power that we have, and then we're looking for you know, religious guidance and uh, an inspiration as to how that power is responsibly to be wielded. And in some ways, look, the, the issue of passivity you address on the farm, because obviously it's a halal farm and the slaughter of animals is via halal tradition and custom and, and law, quite similar to kosher slaughter. And yet both are incredibly controversial, particularly in the UK, in terms of cruelty to animals. I wonder where you stand and what your response to that would be, because I'm sure you've been asked that question more than once. I have. Unfortunately, it's one where I would have to sort of probe where is the basis of, of that question because of course halal slaughter unlike kosher we don't have an issue with the stunning pre-stunning of the animals this is a modern obviously a modern intervention i can understand where the kosher position is coming from that it's, it's possibly a, a change they don't wish to introduce but the muslim scholars have really not found an issue with that 97 percent of halal meat in the uk is slaughtered using a pre-stun is entirely in accordance with the UK regulation, no different. So really, I'd probably say, well, where's that question coming from? Sadly, it's, it's coming from a place that might be other motivations and other reasons why people are actually focusing on that. I have an issue with mainstream slaughter, whether halal or not halal, because yes, we're meeting the basic regulations. The animals go to the abattoir. There is um, a pre-stun that pacifies the animal. It's usually an electrified bath of water. And then there's a small tape recording in our case, um, making a mindful prayer before the slaughter, often a tape recording. And it overlooks the terrible sort of litany of abuse of transportation and obviously the life before death aspect as well of rearing in factory farm conditions. So there's a whole set of issues that I, I find fault with. Um, and I find I, I actually have much more in common with smaller scale farms, uh, non-Muslim farmers who are slaughtering on site and are able to actually handle the welfare issues directly themselves. It comes back to this responsibility issue. But yes, yeah, so halal can bear just as much blame as the mainstream slaughter processes. That's absolutely true. But to pick on halal as if it's somehow different is actually just ignorance because 97% of halal adheres fully to the standard um, regulations for factory farming slaughter in the UK. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I think we shall explore kosher food at another time and use that as a, a good a lever into the question. So, David, you are yourself a vegetarian. I mean, don't humans have a natural biological instinct to eat meat or should we, we all become vegetarians? So I'm vegan and I've been 
vegan for um, 15 years or so and vegetarian since I was 18. I'm not very, uh, very persuaded that arguments from physiology are a very good guide to ethics. It's the kind of argument, I think, where the parallel would be if God had meant us to fly, God would have given us wings. You know, we do all kinds of things like wear clothes that don't seem obviously related to our physiology, but have been quite significant in the way we've come to operate in relation to our environment. And fundamentally, humans are omnivores, like lots of other kinds of animals. And that means we can get nutrition from uh, plants and from animals and human societies in different places at different times have made different decisions. Humans, you know, eaten plants for the most part, supplemented by um, animal proteins at key points. It might have even been quite important for our evolutionary development at some points to access concentrated sources of animal proteins. But none of that, I think, is terribly relevant to what it makes sense for us to eat now. And so I think religious people and others have really good reason, given the impacts of our eating on other creatures where does Christianity sit? I mean, that's your particular interest. I'm sure like Islam and Judaism, there are multiple strands of interpretation. Um, but what have you discovered in your research? One thing people might often think about uh, Christianity in contrast to Judaism and Islam is that food's not important. So people are often aware of food restrictions in relation to uh, Jewish and Islamic traditions, but for Christians, food is not religiously significant. And that's a really bad misunderstanding of Christian history. You know, even in the New, in the New Testament, Christians are debating uh, food rules. By the end of the New Testament, there are still food rules in place about animals offered to idols and animals that have been strangled and animals with blood. And then the later Christian tradition has all kinds of interesting restrictions in monastic communities and then fasting traditions. And even after the Protestant Reformation, when a lot of that gets set aside, there are still really widespread Christian uh, engagement with what it makes sense to eat at different times. And then I think we need to think a Christian understanding of relationships between God, humans and the wider creation mean for the decisions we make uh, about what to eat. And within Christian scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's abundant evidence that the God that Christians worship uh, is a God who is concerned about the flourishing of every kind of living thing and is concerned about how humans are acting in relation to the lives of other creatures and the impacts that they have on other creatures. So in the Old Testament, we've got lots of legislation about how farmed animals ought to be treated. But there's also restrictions on what you can do in relation to wild animals, too. And in the New Testament, too, animals are present in Jesus's teaching. Early Christian accounts of redemption uh, picture God's work in Jesus Christ as reconciling all things in heaven and earth. And so there's this idea of a sort of comprehensive vision of God's dealings with the wider creaturely world. And so I'd like to encourage fellow Christians to think seriously about what it would mean to eat in a way which took seriously God's concern about the flourishing of every creature and the kinds of conditions in which we're currently raising farmed animals, I think can't withstand scrutiny um, if you confess faith in a God who cares about the well-being uh, of creatures. Jesus says not a single sparrow falls apart from your father. And the billions of hens we're keeping in broiler sheds in ways that are massively um, at odds with anything that could reasonably be construed as, you know, conducive to their welfare. You know, Jesus is teaching just there is a remarkable challenge to our sort of widespread norms of practice in relation to consumption of animals. You're listening to Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. My guests this week are David Clough and Lutvi Radvan, and our subject is what we eat. And we've called the show Feeding Body and Soul. It's perfectly reasonable to ask why so much anti-vegetarian commentary surrounds this subject. Kate Stewart, speaking on the Naked Scientist show, Should You Go Vegetarian?, puts it down to good old, bad old human nature. I think it's because people see it as being some sort of moral or ethical comment. And it seems to suggest people who aren't vegetarian or vegan feel that vegetarians and vegans are making some kind of suggestion that non-vegans, non-vegetarians have failed morally. 
can prompt a defensiveness. So you speak to any vegan, they will tell you how common it is for non-vegans to account for their moderate consumption of other animals quite enthusiastically. So that's one common response. But then also quite common is that angry defensiveness turns round as an attack because it's a response to feeling that their own moral thoroughness is being questioned. I'm intrigued in what David said in terms of Christian perspectives, as he's just outlined it, not just in New Testament texts, but in, in Christian tradition. I'm intrigued if there's a sort of similar historical development in Islam. You touched in the first half, you gave us a quote from scripture, from the Quran itself. But over time, what's been the Islamic perspective in terms of food and spirituality? I ask this because I'm very aware of the images of table fellowship, which very much is the, the place where Jesus teaches. He brings people around the table they eat and they discuss and some of the parables and lessons come out of that. Is there a similar tradition in Islam? I think there was certainly an immediate awareness of the rights of creation. As I say, the, the idea of everything based in this concept of stewardship uh, and that the value of man was not just inherent, not because of our art or creativity or, or our scientific abilities, but purely uh, because of our ability to act either in accordance with the will of God or the Sharia or the, the canon law that we evolved or, or to act uh, against that. So I think that was the fundamental change during the Islamic period, possibly. But certainly in terms of legislation on animal rights, there's a whole raft and everything that David was saying resonates very clearly with, with me as well in terms of according rights to animals of burden, uh, in terms of how to produce food, how to manage water resources, a lot of these things were very, very important in the, the early Islamic period. Um, as we developed into a civilization in Baghdad, for example. I mean, going back to fundamentals and just picking up on the word halal again, most people tend to define halal as that last three seconds, the slaughter and the killing of an animal. But actually, if you look in the Quran, there is a passage which says, they ask you what is halal, say to them, what is halal is what is tayyib. And this word tayyib, um, literally means pure, healthy, natural, wholesome, organic. You could use any of those terms to describe something that something that's become pure and natural. And I think this fundamentally cuts across all communities and all faiths that it was a thing understood in previous times that we farmed in a way that didn't destroy the environment. We sowed our seeds in the receding water. We harvested crops. We used natural fertilizers. Probably right up until you know the. the turn of the century, the previous century, that we were actually still farming pretty much organically across the world. I think what's crept past us all is this modern capitalist consumerist production, intense food processing. And that's the real challenge is to recognize that. And I think it's in understanding that, that we realize this is not a debate about veganism, vegetarianism, or meat eating, because equally, we're all in it together. You look at the bulk of vegetable production, it is highly destructive. It's using massive chemical inputs. It's killing animals across the board in terms of the impacts on the rivers, the waterways, the land, the clearing of the land, pesticide, herbicide use. And then finally, the final nail in the coffin of the whole thing is the intense processing of food, often vegetarian food, highly processed. So it's not really the simple dichotomy of meat or veg, but it's actually the production system. Where do you stand in terms of the sort of the artificial, technological, scientific approach to farming? Not so much the processing that you're talking about, but I'm thinking about genome farming and, and things like that. I think from my experience as an academic, a lot of the arguments don't hold very much water. It was argued that we're going back to the Green Revolution of the 70s and various interventions. It was always said, wow, you know, we've got these things. This will triple output. This will triple yields. It will provide food for everyone. You run them out into trials, you sort of get a good response. It seems like it's doing something. You run them out into actual field conditions, and no. There's been a lot of evidence from India, particularly, I could cite, um, which actually shows on traditional smaller plots, yields using traditional varieties, yields are consistently higher. So no one's against the scientific research, of course, but uh, I think um, often it's actually a bit of a shadow play because the real issues and not being addressed. I have a particular concern about the current efforts to try and get approvals for gene editing of animals for the first time in human food systems. 
and not in my case, because I think there's particular religious arguments that prohibit any form of genetic manipulation in principle, but because we've got ample evidence that the human power over the bodies of farmed animals has operated so far just through conventional selective breeding, appallingly to the disadvantage of those farmed animals. You know, broiler chickens are just physiologically incapable of living a life that's flourishing. All they can do is sort of eat and rest. And that's, you know, terrible for the 40 day life. So there's every chance, I think, that if we approve gene editing of farmed animals, that will just give us even more power to reshape animals into more convenient modes of human production. There's that awful dystopian vision in uh, Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake, where chickens have just been completely reconfigured so that they don't have legs or heads or wings anymore, and they're just meat producing organisms. And I think gene editing takes us, you know, one significant step further towards that absolute human control over uh, other animals. I wonder whether the surge of extremist animal right protests in the 1980s damage the cause. I'm thinking about Colin Blakemore, who received death threats and, and others. Uh, any views on this? So I'm a pacifist for Christian uh, reasons, so I'm not in favour of violent protests of, of that kind. And obviously, any time when people are aware of a, a appalling sort of moral wrong, as people were you know, convinced of in relation to particular egregious problems in relation to research experimentation or other kind of abuses of animals. People are very sort of powerfully motivated, but I'd be encouraging people in the movement to use nonviolent means to try and persuade a public that radical change is needed in relation to the way we're treating animals. Funnily enough, I had a part-time job sweeping up in Mill Hill Observatory, which was an animal testing uh, site. So part of my job was, was witnessing the number of animals that were being killed and then actually were ending up going into the waste system there. So I did see a little bit of that and it shocked me. And of course, we've moved away as a result of these interventions from a lot of the cosmetic testing, the sort of spurious testing on animals has now been um, outlawed, which is great. So it's a difficult one. Um, obviously, direct action should never be violent, but we do need to sometimes shake things up. Can I just push back a bit on that? I'm so pleased that our speakers are in agreement. So I'm going to be the one who's the, um, the devil's advocate. But I mentioned earlier in the show about the number of people who are struggling to get food on their plate. They don't have the option of worrying about veganism, vegetarianism, and so on. How much of this, David, I'm looking at you, how much of this is just a first world middle class problem? And actually, we're talking about starvation here. So whatever it takes to put food on my plate, frankly, I'm willing to do it. So I think I want to address this really directly because I think this is a question that's often put in bad faith because the kind of trajectories that uh, Ludwig and I are talking about, you know, whose, whose operations do they most challenge? They, they most challenge business as usual for massive global corporations that are profiting through the exploitation of uh, animals. And so any significant steps in the directions either as are talking about, it's gonna impact that ability to, to operate. And, and so when I go and talk about this stuff, one of the questions I get back is, well, what about the poor or what about people in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, David? And I'm very keen to engage with that question because the global uh, production of animal products is absolutely appalling in terms of providing for human food security. It's still really shocking to me that we take about a third of our global cereal crop and feed that to farmed animals. And the efficiency of doing that rather than giving it to humans to eat directly is about 10%. So we're basically throwing away about a third of global cereal supplies in terms of how far they are useful for human production. And so we need to triangulate between climate and biodiversity and animal welfare and human nutrition and global food security and local examples of food poverty to recognize that this system needs to be radically reconfigured. But 
Um, saying that this is just some kind of elite problem is massively to misunderstand the systemic issues of it. This isn't reducible just to individual decisions about consumption, and those big corporations would like it to be reducible to whether or not you're choosing that burger or another burger at McDonald's. That's not what we're trying to confront. We're trying to confront a, a religious rethinking of uh, food systems that put things back into balance in relation to our impacts on the wider creature world in the sense that it is a first world problem it is we're causing it <laughs> you know the vast majority of all the issues that we're rearing and raising and talking about here are being caused by the food production systems that by and large serve the developed western economies and and then when you look at countries like you know, south america or, or asia and africa which are producing that food for us large areas of their land are being diverted for the production of animals for export to the the west even cut flowers for the export from you know ethiopian irrigated schemes there are so many issues at the heart of this global system that need to be addressed so it is a first world issue but not in the way that you were putting it Plenty of food for thought there. Thanks to my guests, David Clough and Lutvi Radwan, and thanks to you two for listening. If you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did, you might want to browse our archive of podcasts, which includes several fascinating discussions about global sustainability. And feel free to check out other podcasts from the Wolf Institute or from our friends at the Naked Scientists. I'll be back next week with some new guests.